There you go, my man. All right. Let me move some stuff around here, brother. There you go, my man. Right. Let me move some stuff around here, brother. There you go, my man. Uh oh. Hold on, Chad. I gotta. Or hold on. Right. I gotta put this on. Let me move some stuff around here, brother. There you go, my man. Uh oh. Hold on, Chad. I gotta. Or hold on. Right. I gotta put this on. All right. There we go. All right, we had a little delay there, Ryan. I don't know if you knew That's that. That's all right. All right. So when you're watching yourself on Facebook and you're like six seconds behind, that's not good. So um, guys, I'm going to let it build up here a little bit, buddy. Um, just for a second here while we get everybody online. I'm glad everybody came in. This is Ryan Smith. I don't know if you guys know, but what we're doing today is Sales Hustler Spotlight. I want to thank everybody for coming into today's initial. This is the first one, man. Ain't nothing better than the first one. Um, trailblazing. We're trying new things, pushing the limits. That's what this is about. And what we created this for is we wanted to spotlight salesmen across the country, okay? A lot of times in Facebook, we see people come in and out of your timeline, you know, sell a car, a video comes up, but nobody knows the true person. And that's what I wanted to do. There's people doing amazing things across there. You know, you got to remember six months ago, I wasn't even on Facebook, okay? And since then, I've, I've found so many talented people across the country that I want people to know about these people. Um, this is one today. His name's Ryan Smith. He's got an amazing story. And what we're going to do, we're going to talk about it. We're going to hear about it. We're going to go back and hear how he uh, became the man he is today and maybe learn some tricks from him. Um, Ryan, why don't you say yes, hi sir. to him, man? Hello, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well. Ryan, what kind of what I want to talk about today, I was just talking there a second ago is, you know, I just want to spotlight people, man. I think it's amazing what you're doing. Um, and I want other people to get to know you. And if they don't know you, if they haven't uh, friended you yet, you know, I, I want them to find, you know, you, you do amazing things on Facebook. You know, you're, you're always on there. I always see you on the grind. It's constant. It's constant all day. I bet you how many times you post a day. I mean, I try to post at least five, six, seven times a day between Facebook and Instagram. For sure, man. I see, I see them constantly. And a lot of people don't have that dedication and don't have that follow through or that consistency. And I think that's what's really important in this business is to be out there in front of everybody. Um, so are you ready to go, man? Absolutely. Sure right. am. You're the, you're the first guest, man, on Hustler Spotlight. That's pretty cool. Um. I want everybody uh, to learn a little bit about you first. Before we can talk about where you're at today, we need to know where you came from. Where are you from originally? Uh, originally from Tallahassee, Florida, or a, or a sub-city of Tallahassee, Florida called Monticello. I lived there most of my life up until I joined the military in the uh, late 90s. You were in the military. What branch? Uh, U.S. Air Force. Air Force. So you're a smart guy then? Uh, I like to think so. <laughs> All the smart guys go to the Air Force, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, what was your childhood like? My childhood was fantastic. I mean, I was raised in a very loving home, uh, very dedicated and committed parents. You know, I mean, ha had a great childhood. Couldn't have asked for anything better, honestly. Uh, mom and dad, both, uh, are they... Did you have step parents or? Uh... I do have step parents now, but my mom and my mom and dad are both still alive, both still live in Florida, mm -hmm. and I've got amazing step parents on both sides now. So, if they were in uh, Florida and they still are, what took you to where you're at, like Alabama? Uh, when I got out of the Air Force, I originally had plans to go back to Florida, and I ended up in Birmingham uh, to visit my dad because I hadn't seen him in a few months. And uh, stayed here and hung out with him. Eventually went back to Florida. And that was in 1990, 1999, I believe. And that was really, you know, and, and, and you'll learn more about my, my struggles with drugs and alcohol during this conversation. But that was, that was when that really all began, uh, was the late 90s. And I ultimately ended up in Birmingham uh, in a re rehab treatment facility. 
All right, so we'll get there in a second. Um, did did your drinking and stuff like that, did that kind of start in the military or before that when you were like in high school and college and stuff? Uh, it started briefly before it, it worsened when I was in the military, at least the, the alcohol use did. You know, I mean, I was, I mean, I, I messed around with stuff in high school, but nothing to the level that I got involved in once I got out and developed you know, a life-threatening drug addiction. So like, all right, so you're in a small town growing up, right? Yes. All right, so you played high school sports, I would figure? I did. All right, and uh, everything going pretty good there in high school. You probably uh, had you a couple girlfriends, you played sports, you did okay in school? I did do okay in school, yes. So, so what... What led you to go into that road where you're like dabbling? And that's, it's kind of a, that's a tricky question because that's something that I've thought about over the years myself. I mean, you know, growing up in a small town, you know, in a good home, I, I never was around anything, you know, like that. You know, my parents didn't drink, didn't use drugs. I mean, didn't even smoke, you know, so I, I, I would say I kind of lived somewhat of a sheltered life. Okay. And so once I got to that certain point of where I was presented those things, you know, I was able to turn it down, walk away the first few times. And then eventually I just, you know, I caved in to peer pressure and tried. So, so it was more of a peer pressure thing than, hey, I'm looking for an escape. It became a way of an escape, yes. Yeah. Event eventually it became an escape. You know, ultimately, you know, I sought drugs and alcohol as a solution to life's problems. Why do you think that was? I just didn't know how to process it and deal with it. I mean, there was a lot of things that you know, in life in general, you know, we all have, you know, ups and downs and trials and tribulations and things that we're faced with. And, you know, once I became dependent upon, you know, alcohol and drugs, that was my, you know, my scapegoat, so to speak, so that I wouldn't have to deal with it. And it just began to get worse and worse over time. And eventually it was something that, you know, put me in rehab. All right. So let's go back to that first time that you even dabbled. Um, do you remember the time? Do you remember the first time that you started yes. uh, experimenting like that? I do. And was it a thing where you just like, man, I love this. This is awesome. Or was it kind of like it was a building thing? It, it happened gradually. It, I would say it was a gradual build. I mean, the first time I ever drank alcohol was an awful experience. The first time I ever used drugs was an awful experience. You know, both times I said I'd never do this again, you know, and eventually I did. And I mean, it was it was a process that I went through. And I would say over a two to three year decline. You know, I, I, I developed a serious addiction you know, as, a way of, as a way of an escape that, you know, really got a hold of me. Uh, I noticed a lot of times in small towns, small communities, there's not a lot to do, man. There wasn't a lot to do in my hometown, man. So like on the weekends, all the kids, we, we drank, man. That's, that's what we did because there was nothing to do. And uh, a lot of times in small towns, I find that is, you know, after the football games or whatever, you go out you, to the cornfields or whatever, you bonfires and you're drinking as a young junior, senior in high school. Was that the case for you? That was very much so the case. I mean, I went to a small private school. We had 570 kids in K-4 through 12th. Wow. I mean, out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, in a town of less than 10,000. All right. So we leave high school. Where do you go? Where do you go to college at? Uh, Troy University. It's in Alabama there. Okay. Um, did you further a sports career there or was it just a student? No, I was just a student. I mean, my, my, my time at Troy was after the Air Force. Okay. You know, I, I ended up going back to college later in life and finishing. All right. Now, um, the car business. What years did you find the car business? So we were in 99 there. Where did you find the car business? I found the car business in September of 2007. 
Okay. I, I, I had been with the company for years and went on vacation and came back, got laid off and, you know, found my way into the car business through, through job loss. All right. So we have eight years there. We went from 99 to 207. Uh, where did you work before that? Or where, what did you do in that time frame? I was in another industry in a completely different line of, of uh, internal and external sales. All right. Now, I just want to talk about something real cool uh, that's important. And, and, and I, I want to talk about this because I, I think it might help somebody, but I don't want to bring it up if, it, if it's too touchy of a situation for you, Ryan. But okay. I, I, and, it, and if it is, just say, just say don't, sure. I don't want to go over it. But um, at what point you're in this, you know, where you're drinking and you're doing drugs and you're not happy with yourself and you're probably in this cycle of misery at what point did you see, where's your bottom? I mean, where did you find that at? Well, if, 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 if you take a look at my life in a snapshot over the last 17 and a half years, if you go back to 2000, you know, I would, I would consider I've had a bottom three times, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been clean more time the last 17 years than I've been not clean. You know, I was always a binge user. You know, I, I was one that would establish, you know, consistency and recovery and then never deal with life or process bitterness and resentment, you know, fear, you know, the things that we all deal with on a day to day basis. You know, I would never process those things. I, I would stuff them and it would cause me to to relapse, you know, but but my ultimate bottom came September the 18th of last year when I, you know, came pretty close to, you know, losing my wife and kids and, you know, everything. I mean, my last relapse was hands down the worst that I've had. Well, you were talking about your wife there. When did you meet your wife? I met her in 2000, spring of 2000. So if last year, so you've been with her a long time and she's seen the ups and downs of your addiction. She's she has. Boy, that's a strong woman, man. You got yourself a good one, buddy. Yes, yeah, sir. I, I would agree. She's she's the most amazing woman that I've I've ever met. That's 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 awesome, buddy. Um, how hard was it this last time? The last time you said was your bottom. How hard was it to uh, go face her and face your family? It was extremely difficult. You know, I. You know, the guilt and the shame that sets in a after something like that is, you know, is some of the, the most intense, you know, guilt and shame that I think a human could experience, you know, especially when you look back over the past mistakes that you've made and, you know, just the, the trauma that you've put people through because addiction is a devastating issue. I mean, it, it affects, you know, multiple, you know, you know, people in your life, you know, family, friends, co-workers, you know, it, it's a traumatizing experience for anybody that loves the, the addict. Did you have to go tell her or did she find you? No, she, she knew. I mean, it was, I mean, it, it, it was, it was a, something unfolded over a couple of days and it was, it, it was, it was, it was hard. It was hell on earth for her and me. All right, so you go face your family. You tell them, hey, man, I got a problem again. I think I've kicked it a few times. I hear it is again. It keeps coming back on me, okay? But I'm going to go tackle this thing again. How did she react to that? You know, I would say 50-50. You know, it, 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 it had come to the point in, in my life, you know, where she looked me square in the eyes, you know, and she said, Ryan, I mean, she said, at what point do you get this right? I mean, it, it, you're 40 years old, you know, you've, you've been trying to kick this for years. At what point do you figure it out? Right. You know, and, and I was, I mean, I thought she was gone. I mean, I, I didn't think there was any other opportunities to, um, you know, to try to, to try to correct it, you know, but that, you know, it was at that point, you know, where, you know, I got up in my, my living room and she has gone, she had gone to work, kids had gone to school. And I, you know, I paced through the house all day looking at myself in every mirror that I could find, you know, where I came to that, that crossroads, 
you know, where it's what I, what I call the devastation point of my life, you know, where I had to make that conscious decision, you know, internally, you know, to figure out what I had to do to correct this once and for all, you know, and that devastation point to me was always an internal war, mm. you know, between, you know, cause addiction creates a mindset of, of, of worthlessness. You know, I had such a low self-esteem, you know, no self-worth at all, you know, and I had convinced myself over the years that I didn't deserve anything good in life, mm. you know, so I would, I would almost create this self destruction mechanism in my life, you know, and, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people watching that can relate to this. I would start to find success, you know, turn things in my life around. Everything's going great. My marriage, my family work. And then I, I would self destruct. And it's something that I could literally see coming sometimes weeks in advance. Wow. And if I didn't talk about it, you know, eventually it would, it, it just got me. And that was, that was the case this time, you know. So basically it would kind of, it would kind of simmer underneath the skin. You knew it was coming. It was, and it was kind of like a boiling pot and it exploded and then devastation happened. But the, the, the interesting thing I, I, I find about that is I wonder what the root was, why you didn't feel like you deserved success and happiness, you know? You know, I'd like to be able to figure out, obviously, you've had a lot of soul searching, but a lot of people out there, they're probably in the same situation you were a year ago, you know, and they're like, I don't know why I feel this way. I have no clue. What was the turning point for you? Well, I can tell you what the, the, the root of it was bitterness and resentment, you know, and anybody that's familiar with the program of recovery or a 12 step program, you know, has heard the saying you know, bitterness and resentment is, is your next step to a relapse, you know, because I would never, you know, I don't know if you can relate as a man, you know, but I never would process, you know, hurt and pain, disappointment, you know, things like that, all that well. And so to avoid it, I would just not talk about it, you know, and that would lead to just a lot of internal issues, you know, but guilt, the guilt and the shame that I carried for years, was basically why I didn't deserve, you know, because 17 and a half years of on and off addiction, you know, starting from, you know, m with my parents having to go through it with me, even it affected my sister in a negative way and multiple friends into now my wife and kids, you know, you start to convince yourself that you're just not worthy, you know, and when that begins to build over the years, I mean, it's, it, it took root. I mean, I had a, what I called a poison tree living inside of me that was convinced that I didn't deserve anything good at all in life. Can I ask you a, a, a question there? It might be a little personal. Did you ever think at those points that you wanted to end it? Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm a, I mean, Sean, I, I know what it's like to sit with a 45 in your hand and contemplate pulling the trigger. Oh I mean, I know what it's like to sit and stare at lines of cocaine all over the table and your heart pounding out of your chest. And you're worried if you snort another line, your heart's going to explode. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, suicide was something that, you know, danced around in my mind many times. Man. I just never, I just never went through with it. This is why this is why I want to do these things. You know what I'm saying? This conversation, I know it's simple and I know we're just sitting here talking, but man, this might help somebody, brother. You know, you're an amazing man to be able to go through that. And your wife is an amazing woman. You let her know I said that too, because that is amazing that your family and her stuck by you. You got it right. So let's move along a little here. Okay. We're, we're, we went to rehab. It's stuck this time. I can see it's stuck because I've never seen somebody more determined for it to stick. I watch you every day, brother, every day, okay? And I see I've never seen somebody so conscious and determined for their sobriety. I love it, okay? So you go back to your bosses. Were you still working at this dealership when you, uh, when you relapsed? 
Yes, I've, I've, I've been at the dealership I'm at now for uh, almost five years. All right, so you're five years in, you relapse, your managers are probably disappointed in you, everybody's disappointed in you. Um, they probably thought about letting you go, all right? You go back to them and you say, you know what, I'm gonna make a change this time, okay? What did your bosses say at that time? I had a private conversation with two of them specifically. Uh, they were very, very loving, very accepting. You know, this dealership is is a family owned and operated by two by two families. Uh, it's town and country forward here in Bessemer, Alabama, and it's an amazing place to work uh, morally and ethically. One of the most sound environments I've ever been in. You know, it's above board with everything, and they were all all in with anything that they could do to help me, you know, turn my life around. I mean, we didn't let everybody know, you know, other than there was a couple of people here outside of management that knew, but it was just a situation that, you know, they, they, they partnered with me so that, you know, cause I, I attend AA meetings on a regular basis. You know, I'm, I'm very open about that. I go to a lunchtime meeting, not every day, but you know, pretty often, you know, so they were, you know, okay with me leaving every day around lunchtime to, you know, to go to a meeting, you know, I mean, they, they were completely supportive in every way possible. You know, we need more dealerships like that. You know, I think sometimes in the rat race, it all becomes money driven. We forget about the actual salesman, the sales manager, the, the person inside the dealership. And it's, I'm glad that they didn't because look, they're reaping the rewards now, man. You got a happy salesman. You got somebody who's producing, who's positively affecting other people, you know, you probably are that guy that's helping other people at your dealership. I know you probably are, Ryan, because I see yeah. you always want to help people. So, I mean, they, you know, they put their chips in and backed you and now you're going, they're going to reap the rewards because of it. You're going to be a loyal guy. I know that. All right. So, Absolutely. all right. So I see you doing Facebook ads a lot. All right. I do. I see you posting a lot. So, what do you do to generate leads? What are you doing currently? Well, a, a lot of it is, is outside prospecting. I do a lot um, with cross promotional marketing. That's something that I just got introduced really here within the last you know, th few months from um, you know, Mark Jennison and, and uh, Jonathan Dawson. It's something that I utilize uh, through flyers. You know, like we were talking before we started, you know, last month, I delivered uh, 16 and a half units. None of them were fresh ups. They were referrals, owners, service customers uh, to Facebook, you know, ad customers, you know, things like that. You know, it's you know, with the way this industry has changed. When I got in it in 2007, I was at a dealership that on a Saturday would average 100 lot ups a day. Wow. It was just, you know, mass marketing, mass advertising, you know, and, and, and so many customers on a Saturday, we couldn't wait on them all, quite frankly, you know, and you know, that that's changed completely. Yeah. You know, so we've had to find alternative ways to, you know, to generate, you know, our own leads. But as a dealership, we do a lot of, you know, uh, internet leads. I actually had a couple of customers last month, our dealership created a Facebook ad and I just surfed through the comments looking for people that hadn't been responded to. And I, I got a couple of sales off that just by a answering questions. Uh, one YouTube, um, you know, lead, things like that. You're letting a little nugget out of the bag right there. I do the same thing, man. You know how we have Hyund at Hyundai, we have national ads that come out. Every time those pos pop up on my timeline, man, I go in there and I hit every single person that comments and I see where they're located. You know what I mean? And if they're right. coming in there and they're close to me, I'm going to then send them a message because uh, that was really smart of you to do that. But uh, yes. it's a great nugget. Um, do you find a lot of traction from the Facebook ads? Because I think this is the hardest part of our business right now. We're all on social media. We see it there. We know it's important. We know we got to go this route. But a lot of times I don't think anybody really has a firm grasp on how to do it perfectly. So are you getting a lot of traction from that? I wouldn't say I'm getting a lot of traction. You know, it's something that I've struggled. I've struggled with, you know, I, I created 
an ad, uh, I guess about three months ago and got a lead off of it and, you know, generated a customer out of another state. And then I, this, you know, I've created several ads since, and I've got a lot of, of traction with them. My targeting and things like that need a lot of help. And that's something that I've got to work on. I've created ads that, that reach thousands of people and got nothing off of it. Yeah. You know, so I think the point that you make that it's something that we all, you know, need to sharpen our skills on is very valid because I mean, I've had success with it and I've had some that were complete failure. I notice you use video a lot. Is that true? I do. I do. Okay. So, uh, Using video, I think, is very, very important. Now, do you use this, you use QuickPage, obviously? I do. Okay. I've started using QuickPage. All right. So QuickPage is a great app because it allows us to go to the YouTube and do stuff like that. That's all great. Um, I love QuickPage as well. Tell me how you're using QuickPage to uh, talk to your customers. Are you doing it for, like, appointment confirmations? Are you using it for... Uh, uh, a lead generation or leads coming in? How are you using it? Uh, pr predominantly right now for incoming leads, uh, I'll kind of you know, give you the process. If I get an internet lead or a phone up, uh, even if it's a lot up, you know, I delivered one Saturday that was a, a be back from a lot up that I'd had a couple of days earlier. And we, you know, we went through our, you know, you know, demo presentation, you know, the drive and things like that. And soon as he left, I parked the car off to the side, uh, went through my quick page app, you know, took a, a, a good high quality picture of the, of the truck, did a 30 second video of myself and did a, a 90 second walk around of the truck. And then I sent it to him, you know, and the great thing about that is it gives you the opportunity to, to you know, to see that they view it, how many times they view it, how long they're, you know, actually viewing it. And I've had tremendous positive responses. You know, from that, I actually had a guy tell me the other day, he's bought over 30 cars in the last 20 years. And when I sent him the quick page link on a uh, blue Mustang that we had, he said it was the most impressive thing that he's received from a sales rep ever. That's cool, man. Well, that's the way we're supposed to use video. Now, I want to uh, transition a little bit into, say you get some green peas at your dealership. We all get green peas, right? Yes. Right? What would you tell a green pea on the first day of their job if they came up to you and said, Ryan, tell me what, tell me what I should do. What would you tell them? Uh, get committed first and foremost, you know, don't make the mistake that I made, you know, of, of floundering, you know, I mean, you, when you spend, you know, 11 years in an industry and you spend the first 10 years, you know, kind of half in half out, you know, it raises all these what ifs, you know, what if I'd have gotten motivated, you know, five or six years ago or gotten motivated from the start, you know, this, this industry is very rewarding. It's very, it's very trying though on us as individuals and our families. You know, I, I had a conversation with a guy the other day, you know, and I told him, I said, listen, if, if this is what you want to do, you know, go all in right now and get your spouse completely on board. You know, that's something that the owner of our dealership is very strong about is, is our spouses. Yeah. You know, I had a conversation with him actually yesterday, you know, about that. And, and, and it's such a, a, a priority, you know, that he knows where our spouses stand, how they feel, how we communicate with them, you know, and a great, we, we have a, a spiff um, system here where you get unit bonuses at like 12, 15. And so one of the things that I actually implemented with him just to keep April involved and make her feel special, every time I hit my 12th unit, that $500 actually goes to her, not me. Oh, that's cool, man. And, and we actually got a, there's three or four other guys here that do the same thing. So just trying to find ways, you know, to, to, to implement your spouse, if you have one, because, I mean, we work some long days, you know, five, six days a week. And some of these dealerships are open seven days. You've got to get committed and you've got to get your spouse on board. You know, I'm glad you said that, man, because this is, this is something I think we need to touch on just briefly, because this industry has us work a lot, Ryan. You know that. 
Okay. Uh, my dealership, seven days a week, brother. That's why we're open. You know, some states in Florida, definitely in Florida, we're open seven days a week. The biggest problem with this uh, is if your family unit is not supportive and your family unit uh, is, has something wrong with the cog of the system, your, your focus can't be on work, man. You, your focus can't be on work. Everybody has to be on board. And the best thing I ever did was sit my wife down and explain what I need from her and what she needs from me. And I think a lot of people, if you can do that, you're going to be much better off because uh, if you're constantly battling because you don't get enough time and she doesn't get enough time and all the rest, you're never really focusing all in on your job, man. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, personally, for me, it's just an internal, an internal emotional. I mean, I'm a very, I'm an A-type personality. I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was at another store at the time, but our general manager uh, stopped by on a Saturday, and he walked in the door, and he was probably a good 30 yards from me, and I was standing at the sales tower, and, and he, he motioned for me to come over there, and I got over there and he goes, Rhino, he says, man, I can tell you're upset. You're mad. You know, you're frustrated. What's going on? And, you know, I told him and he said, you know, you've got to, you've got to get a hold of your emotions, you know, take the emotion out of this. Cause he said, you're not going to sell this person a car and you're probably not going to sell the next person that you talk to a car. If, if you don't correct this and, you know, and that's something that I still work on to this day, you know, because of, you know, my emotions and, and who I am as a person, sometimes it's hard for me to separate, you know, the two. I think we all get like that, brother. You know, a lot of times people in sales are very A-type personalities. So, you know, we, we get mixed, mixed up with our feelings. You, you do bad with a customer, man. Does it, does it drain on you when you do it, when you mess up with a customer? It kills me, man. Yeah, it does. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of transactions this month where, I mean, quite frankly, I just, you know, I read the customer wrong, you know, through the needs assessment. And, I mean, I blew it. You know, they ended up going and buying somewhere else, you know, and I'll sit there and pick that whole process apart. You know, what I could have done differently because, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this. You know, if, if we look at our closing percentages and, and you take into account, you know, your skill set, I mean, I, I feel like I can close most people that I'm in front of. If I, if I can get face to face with them, you know, I can close them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's, that's, that's not always the case. And, and it's a lot of pressure to put on ourselves. Yeah. Well, that customer you were just talking about, Ryan. When you look back on it and you kind of analyze it, because I know you probably did, what did you come up with? What was what was your misstep? I read a little too much into um, his his verbiage on being in sales himself. You know, he he had been in sales for several years, and he was respectful of our process and respectful of my time. I just I read him wrong in in kind of what he was ultimately trying to accomplish. And he ended up, you know, going to a competitor, you know, just 10, 15 miles down the road and buying the exact same truck. If I, if I could ask you today, obviously it is much different than when five years ago, but what would your bosses say about you today? I would say that they're more, that, that they're more satisfied with, with my commitment level. You know, there was a point in time, you know, even within the last 18 months where my my commitment level to this industry was was called into question. You know, the skill set's always been there. You know, I mean, the consistency was the issue. I mean, I I don't have a problem with saying, I mean, there was months where I could sell, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 cars and struggle to sell five the next month. And, and, and that was one of the things that, that one of the owners of our dealership sat down with me a couple months ago and said that he has noticed the most is he said, Ryan, he says, your level of consistency has just gone to the next level. 
and well, consistency you know, when, comes when you, from process when, and 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 how good your mind is. You know, ex exactly right. You know, I mean, it was a, it was a complete mindset change. You know, and, and I can take you to where I was. You know, driving down the interstate when it hit me. You know, last February, uh, I was listening to Mark Jennison's podcast. And he talked about, you know, his struggles and everything that he had overcome. And he got to a point to where he talked about he'd made the decision that, that he was going to he was going to do this. He was going to turn his life around. And I just remember listening to his verbiage and thinking to myself, if, if he can do this, I can do it. Well, I love Mark Jennison, too. And, I, you know, I love I love the underdog, man, you know, and I love the guy that's. Uh, got grit to him you know somebody that's been through something because I mean we've all been through through something you know and the guys that haven't they're not real resilient sometimes I've found out over times you know they they fold real easy when the wind blows you know what I'm saying so um even though you went through everything um you became stronger because of it so that's pretty cool you know let me ask you a question if you had your old boss, okay, not the one you're currently with, we wouldn't get you in trouble with this guy, your old boss, what advice would you give that boss? How could he get better? Well, I, I, that, that's an easy question for me to answer because I came from a dealership that was, you know, the, the, the management, uh, the GM had the, the mindset that, that sales reps were a dime a dozen. Uh, that we were completely irreplaceable, that it was, you know, everything was our fault. And, you know, I actually walked away from this industry in November of 2011 and said I would never do it again. And that all spawned out of a, a Monday morning sales meeting where, you know, we proceeded to, you know, to get our rear ends handed to us. And, you know, I'm sitting there as a 30, 34 year old man getting cussed out and told how worthless I was, I got up and walked out, you know, and, 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 and you said, you know, Rhino, where are you going? I said, I said, dude, I'm out of here and I'm 34 years old. I don't have to sit here and listen to this. And I walked away and said, I'd never do it again. And I, you know, if, and I still talk to this guy periodically, you know, I've spoken to him in the last 90 days and I don't know if he's changed as a person or what, but, you know, he tried to get me to stay, you know, I told him, you know, a week's not going to change you or this place. And, you know, you can't talk to people that way. You know, you're just, you're not going to motivate a sales staff to go out and perform at their best by, you know, treating them like they're, like they're dirt. You know, a lot of managers are just regular people. They don't know how to deal with their issues either or how to lead people, you know? And a lot of times, man, the only way they know to motivate is the way they were motivated as a young person. That's right. And unfortunately, a lot of times in our industry, uh, people get placed into these leadership positions, but they're really not leaders, they're managers. That's right. You know? Maybe yep. they had, maybe they were good in sales. Maybe they, they knew somebody that promoted them. But uh, oftentimes when they get there, they don't know what to do. And a lot of times they don't try to pursue getting better either. You know, they say, well, I've made it. I'm here. I've got a bunch of people under me. Now I can boss them around instead of trying to look within and try to get better. I think we're constantly should be trying to evolve as people. But yeah, I agree. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I love about where I'm at, you know, coming up on five years here, you know, five sales meetings a week. I mean, I've never heard a negative word, a discouraging word. You know, there's never been one of those sales meetings where, where they walk in and slam doors and picture frames fall off and you're told, you know, how worthless you are. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, we've got 21 sales reps on staff here and I believe 15, 16 of them been here for 13 or 13 or years or longer. Wow. All right. So I always like to ask this question. All right. What's You've been battled through addiction. You've battled, battled through, you know, your family issues with your with your wife. Probably should have left you a couple times, but she didn't. She stayed with you. 
yeah. your work and everything else. What was, if you had to pick one song that describes your life, okay, that describes you, what would it be? Well, I wouldn't say it's a particular song. I am a music fanatic. Uh, I'm more of a, of a melodic type music. And my favorite genre of music is dance music. And if you dive a little bit deeper into that, it's trance, which, you know, stems from my drug years. Uh, it was something that I, that I listened to a lot, but I never, I never lost the passion for the music because it, it stirs something in me emotionally and spiritually. Most of the music that I listen to doesn't have a whole lot of words to it. It's just beats and melody. And that's something that I do every morning on the way to work. You know, I have about a 40 minute drive to work. I'll listen to, um, you know, Jim Rohn. I actually listened to your uh, Facebook Live on the seven, seven step process this morning uh, wow. coming to work. But kind of as I get off the interstate and, you know, I'm five, six minutes away, I, I got three or four songs that I'll flip it to on my SoundCloud account that just really motivate me internally, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And um, that's kind of what I lean on. I mean, there's not really one song more of it's just a, it's just a genre of music that, I, that I'm attracted to. So where do you see your future taking you? Well, that's a fantastic question because, you know, I've created a mission statement for my life, you know, now that I've gotten, you know, a year of, of you know, clean time under my belt. You know, I, I was always a closet at it. Nobody knew I was struggling but me and, you know, the person I was buying drugs from. Are you serious? I mean, I never drank with anyone. Yeah, I hid it from everybody. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, I drank alone. I used drugs alone. And, and a lot of that was just because I knew I had a problem and the issues of guilt and shame were so immense when I would use, I didn't want nobody to know. I mean, so it was something that I was completely in the closet about. And that's why this transparency that I have this time has come about. I've, I've decided that I'm not going to live ashamed of what I went through no more, that I'm going to use it, you know, to change people's lives. And that's, you know, my mission statement now is to share my story you know, with as many people as I can. I told a guy the other day, you know, I mean, he, he said, if, if, if someone will stand still and listen, you'll talk to them. <laughs> Let me, does your, uh, can I, your home dynamics, your home dynamics right now, it, does your wife totally, does your wife totally like trust in you right now? That's gotten a lot better. Okay. I mean, that takes time. That takes time. But yes, it's, it, it's completely different than it was a year ago. That's good. That's a yes. good start, right? It'll keep building every day, I bet. Yeah. All right. So you said your future is to tell as many people your story. Right. You do car sales and then branch, just help everybody around you? Or do you, first, do you see yourself maybe branching out into something else? No, I mean, I'm, I'm completely committed to this industry in, in town and country forward. I want to use my platform that I have with, with my recovery. Uh, I actually reached out to a local drug and alcohol rehabilitation center today to try to partner up with them to do some cross promotional things to, to sow money into their, into their facility to help, um, you know, reach people and things like that. That's awesome. Well, man, where can everybody find you? Uh, they can find me on Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram. I'm, I'm on all of them. You know, if, if um, I'm not as active on Twitter as, as I am on the rest of them, but, you know, any form of social media, you know, that, that's out there, I'm, I'm on it. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is the best form of social media for business? I would say Facebook. Yeah, me too. I haven't really figured out the other forms yet to uh, promote your business. I know, I know people do it. I just, I think Facebook is the best because you can actually talk, you know, uh, the rest of them are just words and 
I really believe a video is way, I, somebody told me it was 1.8 million words as one video. So yeah, I'd rather I, can, video. I can believe it. We need to get uh, Chad on here because uh, guys, just to let you know, what we're going to do now is uh, a lot of you guys shared this, uh, my promotion over the course of the last week. And uh, we're quick page is going to give away a free three month trial to the service. Service is awesome. You've got to try it. I promise you, you will love it. Uh, but they're going to uh, help us out here by sponsoring it. They're going to give three months free to uh, whoever everybody shared. We're going to draw one. And uh, Chad, Chad, I think he's coming on right now. Yeah, he is. He's the CEO of QuickPage. Say hi. How's it going? I'm on. I got the green screen behind me, just practicing a little green screen stuff. So. Everybody, this is Chad Morgan. He is the CEO of QuickPage. He, uh, he developed his own app with a bunch of other people, and uh, he's the head of the company. He uh, reached out to me and said that he would love to help the auto industry, and uh, he's going to give three free months to somebody. So, Chad, I'm going to turn it over to you, buddy. Okay, man. Well, let me try to share my screen and see if it works. Like, this is... Um not uh not uh not as fancy i don't I, I try to look for like some way to like pull it do a drawing but there's nothing out there really so anyway let me just share my screen tell me if you guys see it okay yes you guys see it huh look at that yes, Pretty nice, right? this is professional yeah All right. that's great. i'm gonna click and i'm gonna spin this thing we'll see what happens ready here goes right. good luck everybody There we go. Can you guys see it okay? You can, man. Yes. Stephen Audi Wilmington. There we go, man. Yes. Three, we three, three. Quick page. Hey, Chad, can you tell him what he also wins with that, not just the three free months? $2,000. Like, we were keeping that a secret, but we thought we'd just throw it out there. You've won two. No, I'm just playing. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, nothing like that. Um, I can't see. Let me stop sharing the screen here really quick so I can go back. Uh, so, hey, I'll give you all my support. There's some really cool, like, advanced level things you can do with QuickPage. Like, you can embed little schedulers and things like that. It's We, we tried to make it without doing any sort of, like, um, templates. We kind of took care of the work for you. So you just have to get in there and add it with a few buttons, like, take, take a video, upload a video, some pictures, PDFs, whatever. But there's some other, like, little advanced little secrets you can do, like embed widgets. There's what's called a canned message area. And within that canned message, you can like in, input your uh, your email series or whatever you want to say. Like us sales guys, we say the same same things over and over again sometimes. So uh, we put those little those little widgets there. So you can um you can go ahead and grab those and just place them on the page. And I will give you all my support to help you do any of that kind of stuff, help you with your team. I'm here for you. Whatever you need, I'm your guy. Complete con connection to me on Messenger and uh Let's run with it. You know, give it a try. There's a 14 day free trial for everybody else. If you're gonna if you're gonna try Quick Page out, use Sean's link. Um, I put it in the in the comments on Facebook. So use that link because you'll get five dollars off of the uh, of the monthly. And um, but uh, for uh, our winner, you know, you've got me. It's free three months and with my help and support. Chad, I want to thank you for sponsoring this. I want to thank you for giving the three months free to people. Um, I want everybody to understand QuickPage is just, it's, a, it's an app. It's a tool to help you get more business. That's it. We need to be using it. We need to be using video all the time. We need to be using video for appointment confirmations. We need to be using video for uh, lead generation. We need to be using video all the time. You got birthdays in your CRM that pop up, send them a birthday uh, a video email. These things are are tools that are gonna set you apart. Now, if you're going to download this and use it, uh, Chad was nice enough to give whoever uses my link money off every month, okay? If you don't, you're gonna pay full price. So at least use my link, get the $5 off. It's a great tool, you're gonna to absolutely love it. And thank you very much, Chad. Thank you, Ryan. You're uh, welcome. Guys, we're gonna come back next week. We're gonna do this again. Uh, don't forget our next week's guest is who? That's Billy Sherman. Billy Sherman. Everybody knows Billy Sherman. If you don't know who Billy Sherman is, go, go uh, message him on uh, Facebook. Get in, uh, find out a little bit about him. He's awesome. Thank you guys very much, and I'll see you later. Awesome show, guys. Right, thank you, Sean. You'll have a great day. See you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sean. My pleasure, brother.
Um, it's all the same. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.